Hi, everybody. Welcome to the September edition of the Super Happy Hour featuring um, our first speaker, Riza D'Souza today. Riza, what a delight, what a pleasure to have you speaking in this series. Please take it away and tell us about how you have been living history. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining at this odd hour, hour all over the world. And it's really an honor for me to get to share a little bit about my personal side with you. And I've given a talk like this in the past, but it's usually to high school students or to young college students. And I hope today we've got students, postdocs, and some more senior scientists on board. But I left the title of my talk invariant. How did an Indian Chilean girl from Chicago become an engineering professor at UC Davis? So my story starts at Purdue University in 1961. And like many of you who are probably listening right now, my story is the story of being a child of immigrants. And these are my parents shown right here in that faithful day in 1961 when they met. So my story is a story of three countries, India, Chile, and the United States. So let's start with my father. My father was born in the province of Goa in India, which was a Portuguese colony for 500 years until the 1960s. And you can see that it's just absolutely picturesque with kilometers and kilometers of unspoiled beaches and palm trees and coconuts. So it's a very idyllic place. And my grandmother really wanted my father to stay there and be a fisherman. But my dad had greater ambitions for that. And he understood that education was the key to taking him forward. So he managed to receive a scholarship to go to IIT in Pune and get his undergraduate degree in engineering. And from there, he received a fellowship to attend the University of Notre Dame in Indiana here in the United States to pursue his master's studies. And while he was doing his master's studies and research, he applied to PhD programs and he secured a position in the mechanical and aerospace engineering program at Purdue, which is where he received his doctorate. So now let's switch to another corner of the world and let's go up to the far north of Chile to Antofagasta with a picture shown here. And this is in the middle of the Atacama Desert, which is just a stunning place with high alpine lakes and geysers and flamencos. And I hope you all get a chance to visit there one day because it's really spectacular. And being Chile, it's a very mining oriented country. So my grandfather was a mining engineer and he would bring minerals home for my mom and her siblings to play with. And she tells me these were some of her most favorite toys as a kid were the minerals. So it's no surprise that she had a real passion for geology. So when my mom finished high school, she received a fellowship to go to Santiago and study at the Universidad de Chile. And in fact, she ended up being the very first person to ever get an undergraduate degree in geology at the Universidad de Chile. So she was honored for that about 10 years ago. So it's quite an accomplishment. And from there, she received a fellowship from the um, government of Chile to come to the United States and pursue grad studies. So she spent her first year at Purdue University where you know she met my father. And then she spent her second year at Stanford where she completed her master's degree in geology. And as I mentioned, she had a fellowship from the Chilean government. So this means that she had to go back to Chile for three years and work. But luckily for me, my parents withstood the long distance separation and married and settled in Chicago, Illinois, where my father was a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at the Illinois Institute of Technology. So I grew up on the south side of Chicago in this neighborhood called Beverly. And this is what Wikipedia says about Beverly. It says the neighborhood's roots are largely Irish and Protestant, but it is now home to a large Irish American Catholic community and many Irish establishments. So you can imagine the Brown D'Souza family did not fit so well into this Irish Catholic neighborhood. And we would often get physical mail delivered to our house to the Osuzas instead of the D'Souzas since it was such an Irish neighborhood. So it was a very great place to grow up, lots of freedom. We rode our bikes, we would play kickball, we had to be home by streetlights. So really a very, um, very free, wonderful place to grow up, very safe. And when it came time for me to go to high school, it was expected that I would follow in my sister's footsteps. And she went to a very rigorous college prep school, St. Ignatius, 
run by Jesuit priests. So I was looking for something with the same amount of rigor, but perhaps a little bit more freedom and flexibility than the Jesuit priests. So I did a lot of research when I was uh, finishing my, um, uh, gran my grammar school, and I stumbled upon a um, international baccalaureate program run out of the Lincoln Park High School, a Chicago public school. And several of you are probably familiar with the IB program, which is a really um, solid education, very similar to taking upper division AP classes throughout your um, high school career. So I would commute every day from Beverly to Lincoln Park via downtown Chicago. And it was just tremendously refreshing to see so many different walks of life. And my school itself was very multicultural, very international, all kinds of religions represented. So it was a really wonderful place to grow a bit um, and see more of the world. So like many of you, when it came time to go to college, I went to my state school, which in my case was the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And one of the great benefits of having gone to UIUC is that I learned thermodynamics from Nigel Goldenfeld. So perhaps it's no surprise that I'm still incredibly passionate about that field. But another really important thing was that my father unearthed a program that was run out of Bell Labs, owned by AT&T at that time, the Summer Research Program for Minorities and Women, which ran from about 1974 to about 1994. So they sponsored women and minorities to spend the summer at Bell Laboratories doing basic research. And so I did that for two summers and I worked on particle physics and the experiments that we did were at Brookhaven National Lab on the synchrotron shown here. And it was a great intro for me to see what real research is about, that it's about the act of discovery, and it's not about studying something in a textbook that's already known. So it was really exciting and I uh, enjoyed it so much. And I got a couple publications out of the research that I did there and very strong letters of recommendation. So when it time to, came time to go to graduate school, I decided to attend MIT where I had a Hellman Fellowship, which gave me a scholarship for the first three years so that I could pursue the studies that I was interested in. And of course, having come from atomic physics, I thought I would continue down that path. So I started working in an atomic physics lab, becoming a laser jock, but I kind of was more interested in theory and I wanted to push myself a little bit more. And I came upon this book, which for me was life-changing, Complexity by Roger Lewin, which was all about complex systems and self-organization and life on the edge of chaos. And I was really hooked. And I said, I think the statistical physics stuff is going to enable me to understand self-organization and complex systems. So I started looking all over the Boston area for any researchers working on complex systems. So I started scouring the proceedings of the Santa Fe Institute, looking for people who I could do research with. And luckily for me, I came upon Norman Margolis, who is a research scientist in the lab for computer science at MIT, studying the physics of computation. And with Norman, we convinced Mehran Kardar in the physics department that he should co-advise me and that with their input, I could do a really strong thesis on thermodynamics and information. And that's exactly what happened. So my thesis was looking at thermodynamics and the emergence of structure, information processing and systems, such as looking at reversible models of pattern formation and how we might view events as logic gates. From there, I had the opportunity to pursue postdocs. And I had several different choices of what postdoc to take. And my goals were twofold. I wanted to have autonomy and independence about what I wanted to study. And I wanted to surround myself by the most rigorous, excellent thinkers that I could have the opportunity to. So my first postdoc was at Bell Labs again, but now it was Lucent Technologies instead of AT&T. And I had a joint position between the fundamental math group and the theoretical physics group. And I started taking those ideas I had about self-organization and thermodynamics and thinking about applying it to networks since Bell Labs is the phone company and has a lot of expertise about networks. So my work there was mostly about self-organization and ad hoc networks. And we even managed to get a patent out of some of the ideas that we were pursuing in self-organization. From Bell Labs, I pursued a second postdoc and that was in the theory group at Microsoft Research, where I had the great privilege to work with this amazing woman, Jennifer Chase. And it was the first time in my career, so my second postdoc, first time in my career that I ever had a female scientist to interact with. I'd never had a female professor, 
in any of my undergrad or grad classes. And I'd never had collaborators or mentors who were female. And to work with Jennifer, who's a total powerhouse and very rigorous and a very dynamic person and a strong leader was a great um, privilege for me. And we started working more generally about the mathematics of networks and network formation processes. And at that time, it was the year 2000, the ideas of preferential attachment had just come into vogue and were very interesting to people. And our research, we looked at how we could think about an underlying more fundamental mechanism that could give rise to preferential attachment. And this is one of the papers that came out of this work where we showed that there was an underlying optimization framework that could give rise to preferential attachment. So that was really wonderful, but alas, like all great things, my postdoc had to end and I had to go look for a real job. So given the background that I've told you about, when I went for my job search, I applied for faculty positions in physics, computer science, applied math, and engineering. Physicists really were not interested in my CS conference publications. The computer scientists were not interested in my physical review publications. Applied math didn't seem like the right home for me, and engineering started to sound a lot more appealing. And I started hanging around the engineers more as I was doing these faculty interviews. And I came from physics where we ask a lot about what is the nature of the universe, what is the origin of life, and the more I hung around engineers, the more I started hearing this pervasive question, how can I help people? And I thought, that's really refreshing. And I think this is something that I could do. So I went ahead and accepted a position at UC Davis, which is a very interdisciplinary institution. So my primary appointments are in mechanical and aerospace engineering and in computer science. And in parentheses are the topics that I teach classes in. And I'm also adjunct in applied math and in physics. So I have PhD students from all four of these places. So here's a recent picture of my um, group with all of the talented young people that make everything happen. So I have students from physics, computer science, and applied math at the moment. And it's really great because they push each other to have to understand the bridges between the fields and to question their underlying assumptions as well. And we have visitors and collaborators from a broad range of fields like genomics, political science, animal behavior. And what we do is we study the mathematics of networks. So we're trying to uncover underlying principles about how to connect the structure of networks with the function of networks and apply it in many different domains from engineered systems to social systems to physical systems. And I do want to just mention one of the highlights of my time here at UC Davis is that I got to be the lead on a MURI grant. And if any of you have never heard of the MURI program before, I really wanted to highlight it because it's a wonderful opportunity. So it's a multidisciplinary university research initiative run out of the Department of Defense, although the main focus is on high risk, high reward basic research. And they're typically five year programs with a $6.25 million budget. So the call that I answered was on controlling collective phenomena and complex networks. So I put together a team and our focus was predicting and controlling systems of interdependent networks and how we might inter exploit interdependence for control. So interdependence between systems is fundamental, especially in complex systems where each one on its own acts in its own ways. And we wanted to study diverse empirical systems. So we assembled a team from stat phys, control theory, information theory, civil engineering, nanoscale device physics, and animal behavior. And this is our team right here. So our PI team and our team of incredibly talented students and postdocs spanning UC Davis, Caltech, Rice, and University of Washington. So it was a good challenge for me to learn not only how to do science, but how to manage such a large team. So just to leave you with some reflections. So I think that being different is a real asset. So being original is fundamental to the creative endeavor of doing science. And it also gives you confidence. As you saw my story, I've always looked very different than everyone that's been around me. So I put myself out just by showing up in class. Um, be yourself, you'll be happier and you'll be productive. And one thing I've certainly learned is that no one has a perfect life. I used to think like, oh, I wish I could have that position. I wish I was as smart as that person. And then you get to know them and you realize that they have their own internal conflicts as well. And I think the keys to my success are being passionate, being perseverant and managing distractions, which we could spend a whole hour talking about how to do that. And uh, the final thing I wanted to just leave you with is this um, notion that mentors and role models come piecemeal. There's no magic mentor that's gonna show up and give you the light and the path forward. 
you have to find the mentors by piecemealing a collection of them together, especially in this disruptive era that we live in, that no one's has gonna have followed the path before you. So if you admire someone for something they have, public speaking, teaching, classroom style, reach out to them because people are really willing to help others, especially young people who are enthusiastic. So thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. On behalf of the audience, uh, thank you so much, Raizo. Um, in the interest of time, one quick question, if anybody wants to jump in and ask, just unmute and go for it. Anyone? Okay, I'll ask one then, Raisa. Um, this thing you said about uh, finding a constellation of mentors, um, would you expand on exactly what your own personal magic formula was for how to piece together this constellation? And I, you know, I still haven't even done it yet. And I still, of course, need mentoring myself. And I mentor a lot of people as well. And um, so I think that the, when you're young, you kind of hope that someone is gonna come by and take you under their wing, as we've seen in history of great scientists in the past. But I think we live in a different era and we have to craft our own um, full package of what we're interested in and uh, really try and excel in those things that are important to us. And so I have some mentors who I turn to when I want more practical advice about politics. I have mentors that I turn to when it's about making long-term career decisions. I have some mentors that I turn to in terms of grant opportunities and how I might write those grants. So, um, you know, research teaching service, the three prongs of what we do in academia. And I feel like you can have mentors from all those different areas to help you make sure that you're making the right choices. And once you've assembled this committee of mentors, you can also turn to them for advice as you get more senior, you're gonna find that people are constantly asking you to volunteer your time to do things. And you have to start saying no, you can't say yes to everything. So it's really great to think about what are the most important priorities to you? What do you wanna accomplish with this career? And it's really great to have a team of mentors to bounce some ideas off of and say, you know, I'm thinking of taking on this major role. And then they'll come back to me and say, well, what are you gonna give up in order to do that? So it's, it's very useful to have a team of people to turn to and the group thinking, you know, getting diverse perspectives and inputs from a broad group of people is gonna give you a better quality than just having one mentor anyway. Super, on that very sage note, thank you again, Raisa. Uh, everybody, please put your hands together and 